You know, last week we began a series through the book of Jonah called Fighting or Following. And we saw in Jonah chapter 1 that Jonah the prophet did not want to be caught between God and Nineveh. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He ran the opposite direction. But ultimately, Jonah's fleeing was not just from a calling. It was from the Lord himself. But as Jonah realized, you can't flee from the Lord. You can't outrun him. And then Jonah decides death was better than obedience, so let's just go overboard. But in the midst of his sinking, he finds a fish. And in this fish, he finds something even greater when he finds God's grace. So we have a Bible. Let's meet together in Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. And we'll be going through all of chapter 2. As you're turning there, you may have noticed this if you were here Wednesday night, but I was not here Wednesday night. Wednesday, Renee, myself, and Jonathan all went to Little Rock to see my parents, but also because I had to go to Nashville for a retreat or a conference, whatever you want to call it. And I decided that since I had to be there on Thursday at 1 o'clock, I was not going to wake up at 2 a.m. to drive there. So we went to Little Rock Wednesday, stayed there, and I woke up early about 5, 5.30. All right. About 5 or 5.30. This is a true story. I don't know why the Lord's telling me to stop telling it. It's the still. All right. I woke up at 5.30. We're good. All right. 5 or 5.30. Apparently trying to get closer to 5 was wrong of me to say anyway. But I woke up and originally I was going to leave about 5.45. That was the plan. Get up, wake up, go early, because I wanted to get there about noon. I wanted to get to Nashville about an hour early, so that way if I hit traffic, I was okay. Well, when I looked at my GPS, I saw that it was actually only a a five-and-a-half-hour drive, not a a six-and-a-half-hour. So instead of leaving at 545, I went, I'll go ahead and leave at 645. It'd be all good. Well, I got in my car, put on Google Maps, and started heading that way. And as I was getting out of Little Rock, I noticed Google Maps do something weird. It said it was going to take me 5 hours and 15 minutes to get there. But then it said 5 hours and 25 minutes. 5 hours and 35 minutes. 5 hours and 45 minutes. And I'm going, oh no. But my thought was, surely this is a wreck in Nashville or Memphis. I've got a couple hours before I get there. You know what? It'll be cleaned up by the time I go. But I kept seeing that time go up. And not even 20 minutes later, I found myself stuck in one of the worst traffic jams I've ever been in. Now, being in a traffic jam is already frustrating enough. We'd all agree with that. But I woke up, and I didn't get my coffee. So I was uncaffeinated and stuck in traffic. Not only that, I've been doing this intermittent fasting where I don't eat till noon, which meant I was in my car, I was hungry, I was uncaffeinated, I was tired, I was done. And I saw that time go from arriving an hour early to I was going to be an hour and a half late. So I was mad. So what did I do? I called my loving wife. And men, I don't know if you notice this like I do, but my wife's just a far better Christian than me. Like in every possible sense of the word. So I called her and I'm frustrated and she can tell that I'm hangry, uncaffeinated and just done. And she goes, well, hey, it's okay. You're still going to get there. Now, when you're in that state of mind, you don't want to hear sound reasoning. You don't want to hear the logic, so I said, no, I'm, I'm frustrated. I don't know if I'm going to get there. And she goes, well, it'll be okay. And I was like, I should have just left 30 to 40 minutes earlier. That would have solved all my problems. Well, as the traffic jam started to move, I saw what caused it, and it was four semi-collision. And the conversation came between Renee and I, what would have happened if you left 30 to 40 minutes earlier? You might be late to your destination now, but would you have even arrived if you left earlier? Kind of changed my perspective on that incident. This inconvenience as I perceived it actually turned into a blessing. A blessing in disguise. And you might have been there before where you're in this difficult situation or you're irritated at something, you're mad at something, you're hurt by something, and you think this is just unfortunate, this is just miserable, there's no point to it. But as you look back, maybe a year later, Two, ten, twenty years later, you say, wow, God actually did something doing all that. 
And what was seen as a difficult situation is actually a blessing in disguise. That's what Jonah discovers here in Jonah chapter 2. Jonah thought that death was better than obedience. So he has himself thrown into the sea. But you know what Jonah realizes, as we'll see in this chapter? As he started to sink deeper and deeper, he really didn't want to die. And what he found was a fish. And we look at this fish and go, man, God was punishing Jonah. But Jonah wouldn't say that fish was a punishment. He would say it was in that fish that he found God's grace. It begins in verse 17, chapter 1, by saying, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then listen to chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. So what are we seeing here? We see the Lord appoints a fish to come to Jonah and to swallow him up. Now, this is actually kind of funny if you understand what's going on here, what the author is doing, because the author is saying, here's this created fish that's more obedient to the Lord than his own prophet. In fact, throughout the history of Israel, God would often have a prophet compare them to an animal and say, an animal gets it while you people don't. In fact, we see this in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. It says, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. So what the author of Jonah is doing here is letting us know the fish is more obedient than his prophet. And he appoints this fish, but it's not a punishment. In fact, it's exactly what Jonah needed and where he needed to be. Because the Lord brought Jonah low to raise him up. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2 again. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, from the belly of the fish. Now, remember, when these books of the Bible were written, there, there weren't chapters and verses, and authors would use repeated phrases to let you know the story is still continuing. And this phrase has already been uttered in Jonah chapter 1, when in Jonah chapter 1, verse 6, the captain of the ship finds Jonah descended into the belly of the ship, and he says, why are you sleeping? Arise, call out to your God. Maybe your God will deliver us. But it took a fish to get Jonah to cry out to his God. Jonah should have cried out in chapter 1. He should have said, I'm the problem, Lord. I'm sorry. I repent. But it took a fish. And in the belly of that fish, and we don't know if it's at the tail end of those three days, if it's midway through them, we have no idea. But at some point in the belly of this fish, this disgusting, this vile fish, Jonah finally does what he's supposed to do. And he cries out to the Lord his God. He didn't do that in chapter 1 when he was on a ship. He didn't do that while he was fleeing to Joppa and then fleeing to Tarshish. He called out when he was at his lowest. In the belly of a fish. And then from this prayer, Jonah says in the first six verses, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, and I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars close upon me forever. But catch this. Yet, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Jonah didn't see the fish as a punishment. He saw the fish as a means of deliverance. But we got to ask a question here. You ever wondered why a fish? Like, show of hands, anyone here ever wondered why did he send a fish? Am I the only one who's ever wondered that? Y'all are just better Christians than me and you know exactly why the Lord sent a fish? All right, that's fine. But I've always wondered why a fish? Why didn't the Lord just send a giant bird to swoop Jonah up and to lead him to Nineveh? Why didn't the Lord just cause the waves of the ocean to carry him back to land? Why a fish? Why couldn't the Lord just take Jonah out of the water and lead him to where he needed to go? Because the pattern of God is not to remove us from the physical consequences of our sins, but to meet us in the mess we've created with them. So God sent a fish 
And Jonah cries out to God. And you, he acknowledges that in the midst of his distress, he, he called out to the Lord. Notice he doesn't say, I am in distress and I'm calling out to God. It's past tense. Jonah does not consider the fish to be distressing. He considers sinking to the bottom of the ocean distressing. He was descending deeper and deeper. He even says, and out of the belly of Sheol I cried. And in the Bible, Sheol is the place of the dead. So Jonah was descending deeper and deeper. Death was better than obedience until it wasn't. Until Jonah realized, I'm actually going to die. And in his distress, he cried out to the Lord. And then listen to the very end of that verse. And you heard my voice. This prophet that has fled from God. Fled not just from a calling, but fled from God himself. Calls out to him in the midst of his distress. And God didn't say, are you really sorry? God didn't say, "Mm -mm, not good enough. God didn't say, nah, uh, I'm, I'm angry at you. And he heard me. Jonah knew that even though he had fled from the Lord, no matter how far he tried to flee, Jonah knew it was just one step back. No matter how far you fled from the Lord, you might think you're a thousand miles away from him. Reality is, if you're a believer, you're just one step back. He heard. And Jonah says, for you cast me into the deep. Now this is interesting, right? Is Jonah blaming God for his situation? Is Jonah saying, God, it's your fault that I'm in this? No. He's saying, God, you put me here to show me what I need to do. You put me here so I would look to you. You put me here so I would cry out to you. Because remember, he didn't cry out on the ship. He didn't cry out on dry land. He cried out in the fish and in the depths of the ocean. And it says, verse 4, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. So Jonah knows that he sinned against God. He knows that he's fled from the Lord. But look at his confidence. I will again See your holy temple. Jonah had complete confidence in the mercy of God. And because he is one of the people of God, he knew, even though I fled, I know I'll see your holy temple again. No matter how dire my situation may seem, I know if I cry out to you, you will listen. And Jonah's situation is pretty dire. Look at verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. Now this is significant. Because in Israel, in Hebrew culture, what is one of the holiest places? Where do you meet God outside of the temple? At the top of the mountain. So Jonah is not at the top of the mountain. Where is he? He's at the very bottom. So as though the author is giving us some imagery here and Jonah is communicating his spiritual state, he is far from the Lord. Yet, you brought up my life from the pit. Jonah hasn't been sped out yet, has he? What was the Lord's way of delivering him? The fish. The fish was not a punishment. It was a grace of God to bring Jonah to the point where he recognized, I need you. And he cried out. And my life was raised up from the pit. Isn't that typically what the Lord does with us? In the middle of the lowest moments of our life, that's where he meets us. He doesn't let us wallow in our pain and our suffering without purpose. He reminds us that he's there. He reminds us that he's not giving up on us. And he reminds us that nothing in all of creation will ever snatch you out of your heavenly father's hand. But sometimes we've got to be brought low to see it. Sometimes we've got to be broken to be made beautiful. And it's not a punishment from God when that happens. It is him refining you more into the image of his son. There's another story in the Bible, one of those famous ones that we know of, where someone was brought low just to see their helpless state and flee back to their father. Luke chapter 15 is one of the most popular chapters in all the Bible. Jesus tells three parables. One of a lost sheep. The next, a lost coin. And then he tells one of two lost sons. But we're going to focus on the first one. This son goes to his father and says, Father, give me the share of inheritance that is coming to me. And in Hebrew culture, he's essentially saying, you're better off to me dead. I don't want any kind of relationship with you. So why don't you go ahead and just give me what's coming to me when you die? 
Shameful. The father would have stoned him and been right to do so, but in the father's mercy, he gave the son what he asked for. He gave it to him. So the son goes and does he invest his money wisely? Does he use his money to further the kingdom of God? No, what's he do? He uses it recklessly. If you've got the King James Version of the Bible, it goes a little further than that. Reckless living. And eventually a famine comes. And he's destitute. And this Hebrew man has to go hire himself out to feed pigs. You can't go much lower than that. But what happens when he's at this lowest point? Does he keep trying to figure things out himself? Does he keep trying to get the scraps for the pigs and say, this is fine, this is a good way of life? He says, even the hired servants in my father's house eat better than this. So I will arise and I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired hands. And you don't think as he made every step closer to his father's house, he was rehearsing that speech? rehearsing it, trying to say it just right. But before he's at the house, what happens? His father sees him. And his father doesn't wait for him to get to the house. He gathers up his robes and he runs to him and he falls on his neck and he kisses him and he says, bring the robe, bring the ring. The son can even get out his prepared speech. Why? Because the father wanted him. He came back and the father said, I've been waiting for you and I've been pursuing you since you left. No matter how far you think you've ran, no matter how low you feel, you might think God's not coming after me. He's saying, no, I've gathered up my robes and I'm coming to you and I'm waiting for you to turn around and to see that I'm there. That's the love God has for His people. When we're brought low, it's not a punishment. It is the love of God reminding us that He's right there. Yet you raised my life from the pit. Jonah, at his lowest point, recognized his need for the Lord. He might, be brought, he might have been brought low, oh, but he's been raised. The Lord saved him. In the lowest moment of your life before Christ, when you were made aware of your sin, did God leave you there? He raised you up with Christ. And he gave you new life. But how did that start once the Spirit convicted you? It started with a little word that many of us don't like. It started with repentance. Because the Lord brought Jonah life when he repented. Look at verse, verses 7 through 10. When my life was fading away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard for vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Remember what I said about authors using repeated phrases to make a point? Again, we see that here. So Jonah, in the midst of his prayer, verse 8 is a little strange. He says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. It's almost like he might be targeting the pagan sailors because he doesn't know that after they threw him overboard, what did they do? They made vows and they sacrificed. And now that Jonah is ready to follow the Lord, what is he going to do? I will offer sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. So what are we seeing Jonah do? We're finally seeing the prophet be as holy as the pagans. We're finally seeing the prophet get it. He's saying, Lord, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. And when he makes this phrase, salvation belongs to the Lord, that is a statement of repentance. Do you know why? Because what was Jonah's problem? What are we going to see in chapter 4? Jonah didn't want God to show mercy to the Ninevites. So what's he acknowledging here? I don't control who the Lord saves. I don't control who the Lord shows mercy to. Salvation belongs to the Lord. 
Jonah acknowledges where he's wrong. He turns from it. That's what repentance is. We think repentance is this hard, difficult thing that God gave us as a punishment to make our lives hard. But no, repentance, if we can make it as simple as possible, is a change of mind that results in a change of heart and leads to a change of direction. Jonah was convinced in his mind that he did not think the Ninevites deserved mercy, so he fled. His heart was hard for the Ninevites, and where was his destination? Down. He kept descending, he kept going deeper and deeper into the ocean. But when he realized the Lord controls who he shows his mercy to, the Lord shows mercy to whom he wills, his heart is changed, his mind changed, his heart's changed, and where's his direction going? Out of the ocean on a dry land. Repentance, if we can make it as simple as possible, is changing your mind to lead to a change of heart that results in a change of direction. Think about when you repented of your sin and believed in the finished work of Christ. What did you have to do first? Acknowledge that the sin you thought was okay prior to Christ was actually sinful. We could call that a change of mind. And then what happened? The Holy Spirit changes your heart to see the beauty of the gospel and to see a Savior who came for you. And your direction changed, didn't it? You were no longer going to a very real place called hell. You were going to a very real place called heaven. And repentance is a gift from God for us to acknowledge that we are out of step, out of line with his will, and we are crying out for mercy and grace, knowing that he gives it freely to those who are in Christ. Repentance is not a punishment from God. It is a grace from him to show you there is so much more that you're missing out on. There's so much more that can be had. You just need to repent. Because repentance brings new life. It brings newness into a relationship. Remember for me, I don't know if it was like this for you guys, but when Renee and I got married, uh, we went through what's called the honeymoon phase. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That phase where like nobody does anything wrong. Oh, everything they do is so perfect. Oh, everything's so great. We're going to release a four-week podcast about how we figured out in our first two weeks of marriage how we got it right. We discovered the secret. And then the first fight comes. And you realize she's a sinner. (laughs) And you know what she realizes? He's a worse sinner. And so that was pretty shocking when her and I found that out. Hey, she has not reached perfection yet. I always tell her, you be perfect wasn't for all that sin. She never says that back to me because I got a lot more to work on. But. When we had that first fight, it was hard. And then we started fighting a lot more after the honeymoon phase was over. And when we were fighting, it was always about who's right. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted to be one of those guys, like the first guy in human history who would fight with his wife, and they would say, you were right. That was my goal. Never happened. Lost that goal. But that was how we argue. It was always about being right. And I'm not saying this to say, like, we per- per- we're perfect or that we're going to do a podcast about how to make marriage, marriage better, make your marriage better because we discovered the secret. But the Lord did convict us both of something. And it happened along the same week. We realized that by wanting to be right, we were never right. And that we didn't need to argue our case to each other when we thought that we did something wrong or they thought we did something wrong and we didn't. We just needed to say, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize it was that way. You know what happened after that? Our marriage got real. And it got good. It was way better than the honeymoon phase. It's better than the honeymoon phase today. But it's by recognizing it's not about being right. It's about being willing to say, I'm sorry. And when that happens, new life is breathed into relationships. New life is breathed into the believer. And we say to God, I'm sorry. I don't want to do this anymore. And I want to be more like Christ. New life comes. Through repentance. Because repentance, remember, isn't a punishment. The fish was not a punishment. What is it? A blessing. And so today, what do we need to do as we look at Jonah's story? We need to commit ourselves to repentance. We need to change our lives by committing to a lifestyle of repentance. Notice, lifestyle. Why is a lifestyle necessary? Because if you all don't know, we have this thing called spiritual amnesia from time to time. If you say, no, we don't, I'm fine. I can prove to you that you're not. You ever walked into a room and forgot why you're there? (coughs) 
You ever called somebody and forgot who you were calling or why you were calling them as the phone was ringing? And you think you're not going to forget your sin and go back to it? We have spiritual amnesia a lot. And when that happens, we have to be very quick to repent. One pastor said it best, repentance is a posture we take at the moment of our salvation and we maintain for the rest of our lives. He's not saying you have to get re-saved every day, but he's saying you never as a Christian get out of a posture of repentance. But I feel like so often we think repentance is only something we do when there's a really bad sin. Like repentance is one of those words, we see it in the Bible and we often think, well, David repented, but look at what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. He had to repent. We often think repentance only comes when the sin is egregious, when the sin is awful. But that's because we have a lower view of our sin than God does. And sometimes we don't even notice our sin. And sometimes we've got to be made aware of it by the Holy Spirit. I mentioned I went to that conference this past weekend. And I'll be honest with you, every year I look forward to it. Last year was the first one, and I was counting on the days to go again. It, it was just a great time, and it wasn't like a conference where you sit in a room all day and they just talk at you. I can't stand those. I don't like those at all. But it was just a bunch of pastors from across the country hanging out, talking with one another, investing in each other, and just being real and vulnerable. And not only that, it was a time just to get along with the Lord, to ask for fresh vision, to ask for a renewal in your heart. It's fantastic. And last year when I went, it was revolutionary to my life. It changed the way I, I viewed the Holy Spirit, and it changed the way I, I call intimacy with God. <coughs> so this year I thought, it's going to be about the same. We got to the last day. And the last day is the best part of this retreat because it's a worship session and it's just something holy about it. And instead, I had to repent of a sin I didn't even realize was in my life. I didn't even realize what it was doing in my life. I didn't even realize that it was a sin. And the Holy Spirit's like, hey, big boy, you got to quit doing this. I wasn't even aware of what it was. And that happens to a lot of us. We wonder why we're not growing like we should. We wonder why we're not making progress like we should. And we don't bother to sit down and ask the Holy Spirit, what am I doing in my life that's grieving you that I'm not aware of? When's the last time you asked God to show you sin in your life that you might not be aware of? And I'm going to warn you, when you do this, He is going to answer like, don't expect to pray this and God doesn't say anything. Oh, he's going to show you. The question is, will you repent when he does? Because repentance, remember, isn't a punishment. It is a gift to draw closer to the Lord. It is a gift for us to be made more into the image of Christ. And to love him more and love him deeply. But it's got to begin with, Lord, show me. Show me. Might mean he brings you low but he'll always bring you new life. Lord, show me. And so today, here's what I want you to do. Here in a few moments, we're entering a time of invitation. And what I want you to do is a believer. You might know right now what sin is in your life that you need to repent of. I'm going to ask you to repent of it. To sit where you are, to kneel where you are, or to treat these steps like an altar and come before them as a posture of reverence to the Lord and give it to him. But I would ask every believer in this room, before you stand to worship, I would ask you to ask one simple question of the Holy Spirit. Show me what I'm doing and make me aware of my hidden sin. Please, show me. And then when he does, you know what you get to do? Repent. And it's not behavioral modification. It's not trying to be a better person. It's about being transformed in your mind, in your heart. Because repentance is hard, yes, but it's not a punishment. It's a gift from God. So would you ask the Holy Spirit today to show you where you need to repent and then do it? And if you're not a believer, good news is you can get it on this by repenting and placing your faith in Christ. You will be saved. And you might think you've done too much, but just like the Father in Luke 15, he's already gathered up his robes and he's already running. Would you pray with me this morning?